Okay, so I think we'll start our almost last panel session of this conference, long conference, uh, the Israeli panel. <laughs> uh, we have four very interesting papers today uh, about the transition from mandate to, to state uh, uh, around uh, 1948, before and after. Uh, we will start with uh, Anat Stern, which is uh, who is a lecturer, a lecturer at the Command and Staff College of Israel Defense Force, a member of the Center for Military Studies in the IDF, and, and uh, a teaching fellow at the International uh, Liberal Arts Program at Tel Aviv University, uh, and a very uh, uh, respectable colleague of mine. Uh, and uh, she will talk about uh, uh, the military. Okay, so thank you all for coming, and thank you, Yael, for uh, your introduction. The mic, the mic here. Is this okay? Ah, this one. Uh, where's my presentation? No, this is not my presentation. Hold on, I'm on. No, the patroch, the mat, the Ah, it's more. No? Last thing is, and there it is. Okay. Toda. Okay, so, the 1948 war marked the structural transition of the Jewish society in Palestine from a voluntary community to a sovereign state. As the military clashes between Jews and Palestinians intensified in the first part of the year 1948, the semi-legal Jewish militia, the Haganah, had to quickly evolve from a militia to a regular army. In the legal perspective, this transition meant both modification of the Haganah's legal code, which I will not discuss here today, and on the practical level, the immediate need to address the violations of the law brought by the war that was ongoing since November 1947. One of the biggest challenges for the military legal system was the phenomenon of looting Arab abandoned property throughout the country by civilians and soldiers alike. The paper wishes to explore this phenomenon by analyzing defense arguments heard in the IDF courtrooms in looting trials. The analysis will demonstrate how militia-like norms and collective values of the Yeshuv, the Jewish community, was, is this okay? Okay. Uh, were absorbed and implemented into the formal IDF legal system during a time of transition when the <coughs> Jewish community in, in Palestine became sovereign. This paper is best based on the conclusions of my PhD dissertation about the legal system of the IDF during the 1948 war. In my dissertation, I analyzed 500 legal cases opened for the first time since 1948. Now, the two most common offenses uh, in the IDF were desertion, for 25%, <laughs> and theft and looting, which were also 25%. So you can see um, the actual number of looting cases is, thir is 13, that, that I analyzed was 13%. Uh, there were more cases, but I, I can't go into why they're not presented in this analysis. So I'll just deal with what I have. So. 13% um, um, in total are of looting cases. So before, but before I continue talking about the cases, I want to ask um, a question. So what is the difference between theft and looting? So anybody want to take a, a guess? Possession yeah? by the owner. So the, uh, the theft goods are usually possessed by the, you know, by the victim are loot, looting their not their abandoned. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask this. So what, what makes the difference? Does it make a difference um, a person, when a person walks into, what is, what is uh, <coughs> theft? You, you, a person walks into a place of residence or a place of business, takes something that doesn't belong to him and leaves, right? So does it make a difference if this person is a soldier? Does it make a difference if this person is wearing a uniform? Does it make a difference if this person is, if the owners are not around? It doesn't make a difference. So what makes a difference, or what, what the difference between theft and looting is the political circumstances that surround the act, right? So you have um, um, the Oxford Dictionary. Um, right, this is okay. the Oxford Dictionary um, directs and positions looting within an armed conflict. It defines looting as goods, especially articles of considerable value, taken from an enemy, a captured city, etc., in time of war. Also, in a wider sense, something taken by force uh, or with violence, booty, plunder, spoil, these are all words that describe looting. 
Um, looting was not considered deviant or criminal behavior until the 20th century. Throughout history, the law considered looting as a legitimate form of compensation for poorly paid soldiers, a bona fide spoil of war to which victors were entitled. The international law started to forbid <coughs> looting in the beginning of the 20th century. The Hague Convention of 1907 and the Geneva Convention of 1949 both make it a crime to take or destroy real personal property during the occupation unless it is absolutely necessary. The idea that stands behind these clauses is to minimize suffering and destruction of real or personal property imposed by war. So the key to understanding looting is the key of uh, political circumstances. It is an act of political violence and the, the, and the result of the breakdown of societal law and order and the temporary enabling of permissibility of acts ordinarily deemed as criminal by a specific political context. There are four necessary enabling conditions that transform theft into an act of looting. First, the availability of looters. Men are not born looters. The conjunction between the political circumstances and the presence of armed groups usually encourage acts of looting. Second, the availability of lootable goods. These items should have a market value and must also be portable and physically accessible. Third, the absence of restraint, both moral and actual. Looting happens when there are literally not enough personnel to, met the to maintain law and order and protect property. Absence of military or police force that will guard enemy property. Fourth and most important, a permissible sociocultural environment. In order to perform an act of looting, the looters must share, even for a brief period of time, the same cognitive interpretation of the act of looting. This is a change in morality created a, by, by the political circumstances. They must feel that it is okay to loot and that they can morally justify their act, to, this act to themselves. So all of these four elements existed within the IDF uh, in regards to Arab abandoned property during 19, the 1948 war. So the 1948 war was a total war, a clash between two national, ethnic, and religious communities who fought fiercely for the same piece of land. After a rough start and many losses, uh, the Jewish forces started to gain the upper hand in the battlefields in the second week of April 1948. <coughs> All over Palestine, as soon as the fighting ceased, and sometimes even before that, a wave of plunder and looting began by soldiers and civilians alike. Reports of these occurrences arrived from the various regions, from Haifa and Tzfat, Tiberias and the rural areas, and from Jaffa, which was in close proximity to the largest Jewish city of Tel Aviv. In Jerusalem, as in other mixed cities, there were widespread reports of looting. It appears that the siege of the city and the consequent short shortages spurred, in, uh, spurred on the looting, and the plunder of the Arab property in the city began even before the firing ceased. One scholar has, in, has in, recorded the scene in the city during those days. I'm quoting, while the clearing of Katamon continued, soldiers and civilians started robbing, robbing and plundering the empty houses and carried out furniture, clothes, electric appliances, and food products. It was a shameful display. Many of the soldiers and commanders were disgusted by, this by the sight, but were unable to restrain their friends' raging impulses. Avram Gorali, the general prosecutor of the IDF, and the general prosecutors of the fighting brigades were helpless in, fight of the looting, in, in face of the looting phenomenon. Looting was illegal and completely forbidden by the Haganah and later IDF legal codes. The high command of the, and brigade commanders repeatedly published orders that forbade looting for both operational and moral reasons. One such announcement was dispersed to all army units and pleaded, and this is the original and also the translation. Hebrew soldier. <coughs> When entering a conquered or abandoned Arab settlement, when you see abandoned assets and property, do not be tempted to steal. Restrain yourself in face of temptation. Stay away from the pillage that corrupts the individual and the community. Remember that you are a Hebrew defender and warrior and that you are obliged to honorable behavior during and after the military campaign. Remember that there is only a thin line between the honor of the warrior and the shame of the looter. So this was published two weeks before the proclamation of the State of Israel and this was repeatedly published. So notice the pathos and the pleading, and also note that when you have to publish and republish and republish, it means that it's just ineffective, <laughs> okay? So the legal system tried to maintain the law and order throughout the land. This task was especially difficult since there was no official law. Between November 1947 and May, May 1948, the Haganah forces acted without an official legal code and relied on custom law. The legal code was dis distributed within the army in May but was only officially published in military and state records in September 48, almost a year after the war started. 
the interesting fact here is that even though there was no formal law, the IDF kept the legal code of the Haganah and tried to keep the law in, in the order. The IDF used the militia-like norms that developed throughout the British mandate to do so. The arguments heard in court reflected the extreme circumstances and the transition of political environment. Analysis of the legal files open for this research show that many of the looting offenses were performed by individual soldiers who took various commodities, artifacts, and food supplies for their personal needs. The most common argument made by defendants in military courts was that this was a common behavior, insomuch that it was accepted as normal behavior. Or in the words of defendants, everybody did it, so I did it too. There are many examples for such argumentation in the court, and I will not repeat all of them. I can't go into it. Um, another argument, a common argument, was that def the defendant was unaware that looting was forbidden uh, by army authorities. Other soldiers explained in court that they stole as a result for financial difficulties brought upon them and their families by the war. They were simply trying to help their families who suffered from shortages and sometimes hunger. One soldier who stole household properties from uh, Musrara in Jerusalem explained, Quote, I found the property and the houses. I wanted to sell the property. I was never told that it was not allowed. Everybody took, so I took as well, end quote. Another soldier explained that he took a large piece of cloth from an Arab house in Haifa because his wife didn't have anything to wear. From analysis of the defendant's um, arguments in court, it is evident that the soldiers did not really think that they were doing something wrong when they looted Arab abandoned property. The general notion was that it was bad luck that brought them to court and that looting is justifiable crime under the extreme circumstances of war. The national struggle and the cultural norms allowed the elasticity of moral boundaries that made it possible for these men to steal property and not think that they were guilty or of deviant behavior. In addition to cases of individual soldiers who were caught looting, there are several cases of units, whole units, that looted and sold Arab abandoned property and kept the profit the, um, for the unit's needs. Uh, one of the explanations for the reoccurrence of looting acts by whole military units is the poor organization of the IDF logistical units and the militia-like norms developed within the Haganah. According to the Haganah custom that, uh, that developed between 1920 to 1948, army units had to be in charge of arranging for their own financial support from different means. The units um, kept a, a petty cash, referred to as coupa bit, uh, for their own financial support. So when the war started, there was no IDF. There was no uh, logistical branch, and just th they had to take care of themselves. So this is a quote of um, what the local commanders uh, did. This is the Alexander Alexandroni Brigade commander. His name was Dan Evan, and he just explained what he did. He, he, um, I'm quoting, the he's second on the right. The establishment of the brigade was very difficult. We had no money for even the basic needs, like food, clothes, and shoes. Only in the summer of 1948, the state of Israel came around to help solve these problems. Until then, we held an illegal battalion petty cash that helped the families of the wounded and dead soldiers. The money usually came from selling captured Arab abandoned cat cattle and other property. One of the legal cases examined um, described how Carmeli 23rd Battalion caught 13 cattle heads, arranged for the butchery in Naria, and kept the 256 pounds profit in the battalion's gupa bit. When the battalion commander was prosecuted, he explained that the money was used to buy clothes for his soldiers and support for the battalion's wounded soldiers' families. Although he, um, he was found guilty, the judges mitigated his verdict because he did not take the money for himself but for the better good of his soldiers. <coughs> the judges also admitted that they were aware that this habit exists within many IDF units. Although this kind of takeover was, was viewed as illegal looting, and was strictly forbidding, soldiers and commanders caught looting who proved that they were not doing so for their personal gain, but for the benefit of their unit or larger community, were sentenced to reduced verdict. This phenomenon is another example of the reflection of the issue of social norm and collective ideals onto the, into the legal system of the IDF. It was not considered full-scale stealing if it is done for the betterment of others. The collective ideals of the community changed the values and the cultural norms in light of the extreme political circumstances brought, upon, brought by the upheaval of war. So, in conclusion, in this paper, I argued that the analysis of legal files can provide us with insights regarding common cultural perception of IDF soldiers in, the, in time of extreme political transition. The IDF plunder of Arab abundant property was vast and versatile. Many individual soldiers took the law into their own hands and looted property. When caught, they explained in court that they did not think it was wrong. Everybody did it. It was the norm. 
Others clung to not knowing that this was forbidden or that they needed the property for financial reasons. The normal, normal permissibility that enabled looting was also evident in cases when units uh, used Arab abandoned property for their own needs. Although many tried to terminate it, the Kupa Bet habit was sustained in the IDF brigades until the end of the war. <coughs> the mitigation of the, of the verdicts given to commanders, who proved that the, to the court that the loot was not intended for their private use, but for the better, better use of the whole unit, expresses the way militia-like norms and values of collective responsibility, and not the formal legal code, guided both defendant and judges in the, in the IDF uh, 1948 military code. The Jewish community in 1948 was in transition into a sovereign state. The efforts of the IDF legal system to contain and control the looting phenomenon was nothing less than heroic if one considered similar examples of other places in the world that took place in the 1940s. Law is the mirror of society. It reflects it and is reflected by it. A social analysis of defense arguments can provide us with a different perspective about historical processes. The analysis of the defense argument heard in the IDF courts exemplify how, in fact, legal system absorbed and implemented the norms and values that developed in the Jewish community in Palestine and transformed them into the early days of Israeli sovereignty. Thank you very much. I had, I had, I have nine more seconds. Five according to my watch. So. <laughs>